You may have seen Jake Franzik here at North Point before, hosting Hello Christmas or leading youth group kids. But you may not know the other side of him, the geek side. Jake is an admitted geek about things like movies, video games, gadgets, cars, and Disney. He and his wife Sarah have four kiddos and have been at North Point since 2004. It's here where Jake formed a friendship with another guest this morning, Mike Boatman. When Mike's not working as an associate warden at Fort Dodge Prison, he's crushing 300-yard bombs off the golf tee, catching huge fish, or dunking over one of his four kids on their nine-foot hoop. Mike's wife Rachel has been putting up with his antics for 18 years now. Both Jake and Mike's families have been involved in community groups and youth ministries, where they've made lifelong friendships. Please welcome Jake and Mike. Wow, what a welcome. Yes, thank you, uh, and good morning, North Point. Um, and thank you, Katie, for your words this morning. It was just encouraging to hear how God has been unexpectedly working in her life, and the video is great. I think we only have one complaint. We have a song. <laughs> you know Take how, like, like, high school, junior high couples had songs? Like, Mike and I have a song. <laughs> it's Friends Are Friends Forever. If the Lord's the Lord of them. Yeah, we wanted that to be the backdrop, but it didn't work thematically. But we wanted all of you to know that, that that's like our song. <laughs> Still a good video. Uh, and so Jake and I, in all seriousness, we wanted to just share um, this morning with you some unexpected ways that God's shown up in our community group over the last couple years especially, and shown up through our large group conversations, some smaller group conversations, and even the way we've connected one-on-one. -on -one. And um, just as we've talked through and worked through, just navigated some of these really tough topics um, that we've all been dealing with over the last couple of years. Yeah, so the format of this morning, Mike and I, are, we're just gonna be asking each other some questions, and hopefully by God's grace, there'll be some level of encouragement that you receive out of this. Um, I think the truth is, over the last couple of years, if, if, you've, you know, if you've lived through it like we all have, we know that it's not been the easiest thing to endure. There's been a lot of challenging topics, you know, conversations, all these different things. You could fill in the blank on whatever you want to put in that category. Um, and I, I think just to clarify, we're not going to be talking about things that are core theological issues. We're not talking about like the triune Godhead or, you know, salvation by grace through faith. Um, we're talking more about secondary issues, uh, non-salvation type issues, things like maybe your political leaning or like your trusted news source, um, those types of things. Uh, so that's what we're going to be talking about. Right. So I, I think that you would be hard pressed to find any community group here at North Point or anywhere that every single person in the group feels the same way um, about one of these non-salvation issues. And our, no, our group, I'd say, is no different than that. Um, where maybe we are a little bit different is we have chosen as a group to not, I guess, just have surfacey conversations about these topics. We've really um, chosen to dive in, and I think through that, we've all grown as a result. I think, too, one of the things that's always important to keep in mind is that we, we've all had different experiences, whether it's education or just upbringing or uh, just routines that we go through that get us to the convictions that we're at on some of these secondary issues. And it's just good to appreciate that. And so before we jump into kind of this back and forth that we're going to do, um, uh, we just want to give you a couple high level things that God really showed our community group over the past couple years and uh, share those with you. So the first one was just that God showed us that everything has to flow out of looking to him. If we're not looking to Jesus, if we try to do like some of these conversations that are pretty tension filled, like, we're going we're gonna to be dead in the water. We're going to fall flat on our face. And so he really taught us that we need to look to him first. Um, also, he showed us the importance of, of community and real friendship, that we truly do need each other. If we don't have each other, if we're trying to do this thing on our own, it's not going to go super great. Um, he also showed us the necessity of grace and truth in community. So you know, the, the mission of North Point is cultivating communities of, of grace and truth, but also just within our own community group, we need grace and truth as well. And then he showed us there's just, there's beauty in each person's uniqueness. 
Um, so however you got to whatever convictions you have on these secondary issues, there's beauty in those convictions and beauty in how you're made and how you're wired and it, it's just good for the group as a whole. And so just kind of set the stage. Um, so with that as the backdrop, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask Mike his first question here. And I got it, like I'm looking at some people, they look really concerned about the things that we're gonna talk about. This is gonna be great. Like it's gonna be super encouraging, hopefully. I'm especially looking at your wife. She's like, what is my husband gonna say? She's super concerned, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> All right, so Mike, Mike, the mission of North Point is cultivating communities of grace and truth. Over the past couple of years, how have you seen that mission play out in community group? And how has been pursuing that mission? Has it been rewarding? And maybe how has it been difficult? Yeah, so I'd say, first of all, I think God created us for relationship with him. And God created us to be in relationship, community with other people. So for Rachel and I, like a lot of other families, we're just super, super busy. We have four kids. They're all involved in multiple activities. And with that, we just have a lot of surface level relationships. So people that we have common interests with through sports, school activities, and even Sunday morning church, but not always people that we have an opportunity to go real deep with. And so I think to pursue grace and truth, we do need genuine relationships with other people that most often happen through smaller groups. And so What's been rewarding for me about pursuing grace and truth and about pursuing grace and truth with a group of friends that know and love Jesus is that someone always has something to share that is a reminder of just how good God is and how much he loves us and how he's for us. And so when I'm struggling with work stress, parenting stress, uh, marital stress, or one of my other many flaws, many flaws, there's always somebody in our group that's there encouraging me and pointing me back to Jesus. Um, so that's been really, really good, rewarding, and encouraging. And then as far as um, what's been difficult, I already pointed to this, but we're just busy. And so for our family, I'd say as much as we love our group, it does sometimes feel like just another task that we have to complete uh, with an already busy schedule. But with that, I'd say it's been uh, definitely worth the investment for my wife and myself. And then speaking of busy, I almost forgot I need to follow up with a question. I was just going to start I was talking. just ready to go. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't think either of us envy the position that Jeremy has been in over the last couple of years navigating some just emotionally charged topics. So how has his leadership trickled down to the way that you've led our community group? And how have you seen God work through Jeremy's leadership to shape our group? Yeah, I think if you're a leader of anything, whether it's a, a leader of a church um, or a leader of a community group or a leader at work or maybe a leader in the classroom, if maybe you're a teacher, it's impossible to make everyone 100% happy all of the time. And I think over the past couple of years, that was extremely evident during all the different things that we've, we've gone through as a, a society and a culture. But I think one of the things that was cool about Jeremy is I felt like he leaned into the tension. Like he, he just, he didn't like shy away from it. And so whether that was through like video updates that he did or social media posts or even what he talked about here on this platform or even people that came and spoke on this platform, he really leaned into that tension. And I think he did it in the only way that he really knew how, which was through grace and truth. Um, and I think he'd be the first person to admit that he didn't do it perfectly. I mean, he's also the one who points out often that he's not the hero. You're not the hero. I'm not the hero. It's Jesus. And so if we look to him and we try to, we try to do this through grace and truth, we're going we're gonna to have a good outcome. And I think it was the same for Sarah and I as we tried to lead our group as best we could. You know we didn't do it perfectly all of the time. Um, for those of you that know, I, I, I like really making sure that everyone's happy. Um, if you're an Enneagram person, I'm a nine, which is a peacemaker. And so going into conversations where I knew that it was going to be a, a pretty tension-filled moment and having a 0% chance of everyone like agreeing on everything, that was hard for me. But I think I'm better for it as a person, and I'm, I'm really glad to have gone through it. I don't want to go through it again, though, because I like people to get along. <laughs> and I'm not a nine. <laughs> you are not a nine. This is so true. Okay, so in our community group, Mike, we have a variety of convictions on what we would call like non-salvation, secondary type issues. Things like political ideologies, theological bends, parenting convictions, personal liberties, the list kind of goes on and on. What's been beneficial about being in a group like ours where we've talked about these sorts of things and what have you learned about yourself as a result of doing so? Sure. So I'd say at one point in my life, these non-salvation issues were as close to salvation issues as they possibly could be. So I was definitely somebody that if you didn't fit 
into the political side or if you were on a certain political side, I, I honestly didn't understand how you could really even be a Christian. Or um, if, if you thought contrary to me on certain social issues, it just didn't make sense with what I thought a, Christ, a Christian should look like. Um, and so for me, while my personal convictions haven't really changed about some of these issues, I think what I've come to realize is that they're just that, they're personal convictions they aren't everyone's convictions, and they aren't deal breakers in terms of salvation. So I've been fortunate that God has put some really good people into my life that I differ with on a number of these issues, but I know they love God, they love people, and I know that their hearts are in the right place. And so for me, Jake has been one of those people. Jake has become a dear friend, but Jake's, he's a left-leaning Christian who claims to be a moderate. And <laughs> I think that's, like, I, that's probably pretty normal for left-leaning Christians. They, they all want to be moderates. I think a lot of people, more, I've heard more people claim to be moderates, like, in the last couple years than at any other point, um, I guess, in my life. And, and I get it, but it's true. That does, that does happen. Are you going to move on? You no. move on. I'm kind of going to be stuck. I'm just going to hover <laughs> right here. Um, no, so I'm kidding. But, you know, I do think it's important for our growth as followers of Jesus to have people in our life that we don't always agree with, specifically on some of these issues. And so our community group does have a lot of thoughts on these non-salvation issues, and I believe that the trust that we have for one another and our similar foundation in Jesus, that's what allows us to tackle these conversations without necessarily wanting to tackle each other. And so with all of that said, I'll tell you this, that my tendency is still to find myself elevating some of these issues higher than the non-salvation issues that they are. And if I'm honest, I think that tends to happen more when I'm allowing media outlets, social media, or like-minded conservatives to shape my beliefs about something rather than praying and seeking God on how he wants me to think about whatever that topic is. So my dad used to tell me, he used to say that if you want to know what you worship, you need to look at your calendar and your checkbook. And I think you could add to that your phone's search history, the things you think about throughout the day, and for many of us, where we stand politically. And I think for all of us, in light of the polarizing time that we're in, we need to think about how we want to be known as people that are pursuing grace and truth. And I guess for me, I don't want to be known for my strong stance on some of these non-salvation issues. I want to be known as somebody that looks like, that loves like, and serves like Jesus. And so what about you? Amen. Be I just, amen. amen. That's Thank great. Yeah. And so what about you? Because um, we've had some intense conversations around these non-salvation issues. And I would just ask, what concerns you the most when we're diving into these issues as a community group leader? And then how do you manage those conversations and why are they worth having? Yeah, so I, there's a lot in that question. I mean, I'll answer the last part first. Why do I think that the conversations are worth having? I do think that they're worth having. I mean, we had them, um, but I think they're, they're important for having for a couple different reasons. I think the first one is, like, if you think about a conversation that is kind of a, a challenging conversation, if there isn't a level of trust between the two people who are having the conversation, you're kind of just spinning your tires. I mean, it could end up in like yelling or bitterness or whatever. And so in our community group, we already had that level of established trust, which I think was super helpful. And I think the, the truth is too, over the past couple of years, we've been in the situation where, I mean, sometimes we didn't even know what we could say or what we should say, you know, what words were okay to say. And, and hear me carefully, like I think that was a good exercise for us to go through to understand the impact of words, the power that our words can have and the effect that they can have on other people. But it also made this, you know, kind of, correlating challenge of, man, I, I don't know how to process these things if I don't know what to say. And it made pe people maybe feel like they had to process things in a vacuum. And so being able to have open conversations where trust was there, where Jesus was our North Star, in a place where, you know, we, we all had like-minded, you know, like really high, um, just what our, our, our most important goals were, was, was really important. I think the other reason it was worth having is because we got to know each other better. I mean, I know Mike better as a result of dying into, diving into tension-filled topics than I would have if we just 
talked about the previous week's sermon, and then talked about golf. I mean, I know now how much Mike really cares for the disenfranchised, for those that don't have much. And I know so much more his passion and his love for Jesus as a result. And so I think they were worth having for that, um, that just that so we were able to see each other's hearts. I, how we manage the conversations, I'll say this, like it was, it was a little bit scary at times. I, scared is probably isn't the right word, concerning. You know, Sarah and I, we'd pray before you guys would come over and be like, Lord, help us. We know that this is going to be maybe a moment. Give us grace. And so lots of prayer, lots of grace. Um, because the truth is that strong convictions existed for each person for a reason. And so what we tried to encourage people to do was, you know, try to be a listener first, try to be a learner and not try to take this as a moment to say, I'm going to convince everybody of my position. And if you don't agree with me, you're stupid. Um, we didn't want to have that sort of situation. I think sometimes what we can do, this may come across a little strong, but I think we can tend to pontificate our ideas more than we should. And instead, maybe we should just have like good conversations like what we tried to have and, and try to think through all of the implications of whatever the position is. Um, I, I personally, were you going to say something? I just thought you were about done. Oh, no. This, I know, this, this is a big question. <laughs> I, I think we, I also tried to bring up maybe some underrepresented sides of, of the arguments that we were having. I think God taught me over the past few years that that there's, there are smart, intellectual, thoughtful, kind, intelligent people on every side of a multi-sided issue. And so I, I think that that's just been really good for me to understand that, and I think for our group as well to understand that there's, there's way more to an issue than maybe what can be articulated in a, in a Facebook post or a, a, a tweet on Twitter. Um, I think it's, it's just good for us to, to keep that in mind. And I also try to keep us out of confirmation bias, you know, this thought that if anything agrees with what I say, then I'm going to accept that, and if it disagrees, then I'm going to categorically reject it. And I think as far as concerns, because you asked about concerns, I think the biggest concern was just that we'd walk away hating each other, you know? And thankfully, God's grace, that didn't happen, um, but that was definitely a concern for sure. And I feel like as a group that, that we're better as a result of diving in and digging in, um, but that certainly was a concern. God was very gracious. Okay, so last question for you, Mike. Um, your life story, it's a beautiful picture that God truly does have a plan for his children. And when you think back over the last couple years, how, how has God used people, community to keep you on that path? And what action did you have to take or maybe something that you had to give up in order to fully surrender to maybe what Jesus was doing? Yeah, so first of all, did you use the word pontificate? just to sound smarter than me? Just when I'm talking with you. Okay. Yeah, had nothing to do with anyone else. Uh, so your question. So I think the people that we surround ourselves with are always going to be connected to the decisions that we make. So for all of us, if you think about the four or five people closest to you in your life, it's very likely that your life looks a lot like theirs. So these same people shape our thoughts, our beliefs, and our attitudes. So I think for that reason, community is always important. If I want to be pursuing grace and truth, I probably need to be surrounding myself with people that are pursuing grace and truth. And um, as far as, you know, what I've had to surrender or what I'm surrendering, I think that's definitely more of a process than it is an event. Um, so Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians when he says, I die daily. And what he's saying there is that every day I'm dying to my own desires and I'm seeking God's desires, surrendering my will for his. And I think that's probably a good blueprint for all of us and one that I certainly desire, um, but I probably get it wrong more than I get it right. But I will say it's all a lot easier when we are surrounding ourselves with good and good people. I think as we do that, we just have a tendency to probably desire what is not good less than we otherwise would. Did you want to ask me one more question? Kind of. Okay. That's okay. <laughs> so just like me and my wife and you and your wife, we're all busy. Um, families are busy. And so there may be people that are reluctant to get involved in a community group like ours. So as we move into 2022, what would you say to encourage people um, about taking that next step? Yeah, I think the first thing, maybe after hearing us talk, people don't want to be part of our community group. For that, sure. That could be possible. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, I'll keep this one kind of quick and to the point. I think the truth is we just need people. 
We need people in our lives. God designed us that way. He designed us for community. Um, so I would say if, if you have any sort of hesitancy at all about putting yourself out there and being in a, in a community group, I would say lean into it. Lean into the uncomfortability of, of what exists when you put yourself out there. I, I think sometimes people would maybe call me an extrovert. Um, they think that it's super easy for extroverts to make friends. And I would say maybe like on a super surfacey level, but I think it's hard for anyone to really manage and keep deep, good, like true friends. And so I know that it's hard. It's, it was hard in junior high. <laughs> it's hard in middle school. As a 41-year-old, it's still hard for me today to, to really lean into that. But I think the fruit is definitely worth it. The fruit of having friendships that you can count on and rely on, that, that you can call in the middle of the night and know that that, that person is going to be there, that they're going to pick up the phone, that you don't feel guilty for calling them. Um, that's really important. And I would just encourage you to lean into that. And so I hopefully this, this little back and forth thing was, was beneficial and maybe an encouragement. Maybe some people are like, gosh, I wish they would have got into it a little bit more. Um, but I don't know that that would have been super beneficial. Um, we, we're, just, we're thankful to be part of a community that, that really does love Jesus, honor Jesus, and uh, that can have difficult and tough conversations and come out on the other side smiling and still loving each other. Because I do. I love you, man. <laughs> so let me just to wrap it up, I'm going to pray for us and, uh, and then we'll close out. The band's going to come out. We'll sing one more song.